Howdy everybody, welcome back to Lab Hours. Today we're going to be covering the first of two mini lectures on common probability distributions. Now, uh, basically all this is going to be is just me giving you the deets on some of these special, common, useful distributions, all right? Uh, and a quick warning, like these two Bernoulli and Uniform, uh, we've either already seen or they're just kind of under the level that we're at right now and we're just going to give them to you so that you have them, right? Uh, the main chunk of this video is going to be focused on the normal uh, random variables and in this video I'm going to also introduce you to a very useful resource that will uh, keep track of a bunch of like common distributions for you. It'll show you how to find expected value and variance of those so we can save some time in the video and just give you that resource. Uh, you'll get it off of Learning Suite if you're in the class, but if you're not in the class I wanted to make it available to you because it's kind of nice and we can teach you, you know, how to read probabilities off of a normal PDF, for example. So let's go ahead, let's get right into it with the Bernoulli random variable. And this one actually isn't even a continuous random variable. It's actually just discrete, right? This is a discrete distribution. So let me first introduce some notation I'm not sure we have introduced so far. Uh, let's do the following. If I were to, for example, flip a coin, the outcome heads or tails could be considered a random event, right? It's kind of one of our quintessential examples of a random event. So uh, maybe if I were only interested in their ever, uh, of it ever hitting heads, right, I could call heads H. And then the way that I would mark this out, right, um, is I would say H is distributed as a Bernoulli random variable with a parameter of 0.5. You don't know what that means yet, but we're about to get there. I just wanted to show it to you so that when I show you what the actual like parameters and stuff are, you're not fully lost and you have no context, right? So in the generic form, a Bernoulli random variable looks like this. You know, x is distributed as a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p. What does that mean? What does this look like, right? I want to introduce the idea of this is distributed as, right, and then something special. All of these that we're going to show you for this mini lecture and the next one are going to deal with the fact that like there are some PDFs that are so useful that we've just given them a special name as a shortcut. This one is a shortcut, right? When I say x is distributed as, that's how we're reading this tilde here, is, is distributed as a Bernoulli random variable with parameter p. Here's what I mean. I mean that the probability that the random variable x is equal to some specific value of x is equal to 1 minus p if x is 0 and p if x is 1. That's all I mean. Where, for example, if my variable is getting heads on a coin flip, 1 would be a success. I got heads. 0 would be a failure. I got tails, right? And this p obviously is 0.5. And then 1 minus p is also 0.5 coincidentally. But let's say, for example, you had a coin that was weighted. Let's uh, call that k, just for it not being a real coin, maybe. Maybe you could say that k was distributed as a Bernoulli random variable with the parameter 0.25. k would be getting heads on a coin that is weighted for tails here in this case. So that would look like the probability that k, the random variable, is equal to some specific value of k would be equal to, you know, 0.75 if k equals 0 and 0.25 if k is equal to 1, right? All that this is saying is like, if you saw this coin, you would say, oh, that's not very balanced. If you saw this one, you would say, well, if you saw this one, you would say, that's pretty balanced, right? That's a balanced coin. It succeeds half the time, it fails half the time. And in terms of like the actual shape of this distribution, it's actually just a histogram, right? This one is literally a histogram. So we call that one, you know, to two, and we aren't including the two, of course. This would be, you know, a bar of one mi area one minus p, and this would be a bar of area, you know, p, right? So if I wanted to take the expected value, of course I would do the thing times the probability of the thing for all the values of the thing as we've seen before. Again, I'm not going to refresh you too much on this one. We don't need to spend much time on it. It's going to be on the sheet that we give you, and you've already known how to calculate like expected value 
of, from discrete distributions and like expected value, variance, all sorts of stuff like that, you've known how to do that for a long time and hopefully you're comfortable with it by now. So we're not gonna spend more time on it. That's the Bernoulli distribution. Now let's talk about the uniform distribution and actually we have talked about it before. Uh, if we go back to the lecture where we first introduced the idea of a continuous PDF, I actually gave you a uniform distribution and I mentioned that in that previous video that I was going to show it to you later. Well, now is the day. Um, the uniform distribution is the PDF that is flat, okay? It's uniformly distributed across an interval. In this case, it was 0 to 7 or 0 to 6 when we were first talking about it, right? So let me come back to where we were, right? And let me just give you the interesting things about the uniform distribution. This one is really cool, right? So if I say that x is a random variable and it's distributed as a uniform random variable, I have to give it two parameters. I need to give it a parameter A and a parameter B. All that those parameters are, A and B, are the lower and upper bounds of like the uniform distribution. So again, back from this example that we had before, when I find it, it's right here. In this case, this distribution that we ended up with, the pink one right here, would look like this, you know, x was distributed as a uniform random variable with parameters 0 and 7, right? Because it started at 0 and it went to 7. Easy peasy. Okay, that's what the uniform distribution looks like. The nice thing is uh, I can also just straight up give you the PDF to this one as well. Let me unerase that. The PDF looks like this. Uh, we would say f of x is equal to 1 over b minus a for a is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to b or you know x is an element of the interval a to b right equivalent notations uh, the other nice thing is I can give you things like the CDF for this one because it's really easy and nice uh, but I'm not gonna do that because again just like this one I'll give you the PDF uh, I'll give you what it looks like, right? Let's draw what this one looks like. Uh, you know, it's flat. Here's A, here's B, and in fact it doesn't have to start at zero, right? It can start anywhere on the number line, right? And the height of this, of course, is just going to be 1 over B minus A. It's going to be, you know, st as tall as it needs to be so that if you integrate it over its bounds, it turns into 1, right? This is just a rectangle. And so if the base is 6, this needs to be 1 sixth, right? Easy peasy. Nothing crazy that we've ever seen before. How would I find the expected value of this one? I'm going to do exactly what I did previously, right, with my distributions. If I wanted to find the expected value, I'd integrate from A to B, which are the bounds of the thing, which would be x if I were looking for the expected value of x given that x is distributed as a uniform random variable. It's just x times the probability of x. In this case, it's PDF, which would be 1 over b minus a dx, right? You work all that out, and you get, it turns out, you get uh, something really nice. It actually turns into just uh, b minus a over 2, which hopefully you can see is the case, right? Like, what is the average between b and a if everything is likely? Well, it's just b plus a divided by 2. It's going to land right in the middle, right? I'm going to hit this as often as I hit that, as often as I hit that, as often as I hit that, and it eventually just averages to the middle. Super cool stuff. Encourage you to try that out. But again, this is just me showing you, like, nothing has changed. We're just giving it a fun, funky little nickname as a shortcut, right? x is distributed as a uniform random variable. Again, this is going to be on the sheet, so if you forget, also, this is not b minus a. That's my bad. It's actually b plus a. It turns into b plus a over 2. So that's a correction that you will see when you look at the sheet. It's going to be great. <laughs> let's, uh, let's call the uniform distribution there. And now let's get into the meat of this class. The normal distribution and the t distribution that we're going to talk about tomorrow are the meat and the potatoes of this class. Like They are almost the entire meal, quite frankly. Okay. Let's talk about the normal let's talk about the normal variable. Let me give you what it looks like first in its general form. Let's say that x is distributed as a normal random variable. It's so special and so useful that we don't even write the word normal. We just write n, right? It has two parameters. 
and the two parameters are the expected value of x and the variance of x, right? Or you'll also see that written as x is distributed as a normal random variable with mean mu and variance sigma squared, like we've seen prior, right? We know that these are the same thing at this point. Uh, later, it won't be the same thing because we'll talk about estimators and parameters, and these will kind of change and get a little bit funky. But for now, they're the same thing, okay? What does this look like? Well, actually, you might be wondering, like, what is the actual PDF for, you know, a normal variable? The really interesting thing is that it's a horrible, terrible equation. So let me just show you what it is instead of, uh, instead of trying to, like, um, sorry, i got to think for a second. Instead of trying to write it out for you, let me just show you what it looks like. Here's how you get this table that I've been talking about. You go to tmorg.org slash downloads and it'll pull up this page right here this is the distributions estimators and probability tables document that uh, has been passed down through econ 378 for as long as I can remember uh, that being since I took the class last year I'm assuming it's existed for a long time so I don't feel bad sharing it with you uh, you'll be able to download the file from here which I'm gonna go ahead and do right and that'll just open it in my browser, but I can actually save it if you want. And actually, I'd recommend saving it, but for now, all I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to switch back to here, and I'm going to pull it up in a little window that we can't read. So never mind. Let's half screen it. <laughs> okay, here we go. So check this out. This is what the PDF looks like, the normal distribution. The one thing I don't like about this is that I can't, like, laser it for you, so... You just have to kind of look, right? Right here, this is the function, the probability density function. It looks gross, uh, but you can see we've got x minus mu over sigma squared, all of that times negative one half raised to the e, all of that multiplied by one over sigma, the square root of two pi. It's a huge, terrible thing. And then over here, like that's the PDF, right? Right, so I have what kind of distribution is it? The PDF and then the CDF. Now I've spoiled the CDF from the uniform distribution that I told you I was going to leave for you as an exercise, but you'll notice that the mean is exactly what I told you it was once I had corrected myself, which is really nice. There's what the variance is, in case you wanted to skip that step. But again, it's just going to be on here. You don't have to figure it out by yourself, right? Here's the Bernoulli distribution. It's discrete, right? So it looks like, you know, what's its mean? Boom. What's its variance? Boom. It's pretty cool. It's great stuff. But let's keep talking about normal for a second. Okay, I'm actually going to put this away for a second, and let's keep talking about normal. We know what the normal vari what the normal distribution looks like. It's a bell curve, and it's and 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 it's really nice because this bell curve has some super super amazing properties. The one thing about the normal curve is that, like, you can add them to. Well, well, first of all, let's talk about the fact that like mu can be different and sigma squared can be different for different variables. So you can have a bunch of different normal distributions. Just like you can have a uniform distribution that's between like 0 and 7, you could have a normal distribution between like 2 and like 23, you know? Those are different distributions. They're going to look different, right? They'll be the same shape, but they're going to look different. The really cool thing about normal variables is that they're going to look similar, but they're going to be different, okay? So let's say I had a variable that was, you know, distributed as a normal variable with mean of 12 and variance of 2,000. And then let's say I have another random variable that's distributed as a normal random variable with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. And in fact, let's call that one Z just for fun. No real reason. n12, right? The nice thing about the bell curve is that it is centered at its mean. So right here, this would be 12. And the really interesting thing is that the size of like the tails captures the variance of the thing. So I would have this like really big tail. And then we're just going to go ahead and go like this, right? Why does that make sense? If the variance is bigger, the tails are higher. Why? 
because if the variance is bigger, that means you're farther away from the mean more often. So these numbers out here are going to happen more often. They're going to be relatively likely when compared with the mean. If my mean is 12 and my variance is 2,000, this is not going to be a very big bell curve. It's going to be pretty flat, right? Something like that. Because all of these are happening super often, right? X is super variable, so you know it's not that clustered around the mean. However, this like standard normal one is going to look kind of like this, right? It's going to be nice. It's going to be exactly like the normal distribution that you're used to, with a centered at zero. And the really nice thing about this is that this standard normal distribution is basically what we are going to use as the basis for the entire rest of the class. So I'm going to teach you two super important things about this. One, I'm going to teach you how to take a random variable like x that is not pretty. It's not pretty and how you can turn it into a standard normal. This is what it's called. It's a standard normal. If the mean is 0 and the variance is 1, that's a standard normal variable. And we usually use z's to denote those. And you'll see on the chart when I show you in just a second, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about this for a little bit. So let's get rid of this for a second. Okay, How can I turn a normal random variable into a standard normal variable? Let's talk about this. Okay. If I have this x right here, right, all I have to do to take a normal variable and standardize it is do the following. Subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation. That's it. And that will give me a standard normal variable. How does that make any sense? Right? Let's talk about this. Well, let's take this x from up here, this 12 and 2,000, right? And let's go ahead and try to draw something like this, is what it would look like, right? And we'll call that 12, and we're going to pretend that this is centered because you're very nice and kind to me, right? Let's do this in red. 12 is here. If I took every single observation on this graph and I subtracted the mean from it, if I subtracted 12, where would the graph be centered and would it change the shape of the graph? The answer to the first question is yes, and the answer to the second question is no. If I took every single point here, every single line, and just moved it 12 to the left, what I get is I get the exact same graph, but now it's centered at 0. right? Because I've taken this point, I've taken that point, I've taken that point, I've taken every single point on the graph and just moved it left 12. That's what the subtracting the mean does. okay? Now what we also need to deal with is we need to deal with the fact that these tails are too big. They're too spread out. Okay. So what do we do? Well, we divide this x minus mu by the standard deviation. And basically what that does is it takes the ones that are super far away in terms of standard deviations. Like this would be like five or six standard deviations away. And what it does is it shrinks them. Right? So instead of this being 5 times the standard deviation of x, the probability out here, it's going to turn into just 5. It's going to be way shorter. It's going to be way smaller. Okay? Especially if the standard deviation of x is like the square root of 2,000, which is, you know, like square root of 2 times 10. That's a big number. Right? The standard deviation of a standard normal is going to be 1. So what we're going to do is we're just going to shrink the tails down and clench this all up into the middle so that by dividing by the standard deviation we get a bell curve that looks more like we're used to. Right? Something like that. Where the tails aren't as big and things are way more clustered around the mean. Okay, this is how you standardize a normal variable. Now what's the point of standardizing a normal variable though? What is the purpose? Why would I bother doing that? Okay? Let me tell you why I would do that. The PDF of the normal random variable, as we have seen, is quite feral. There is a lot going on there. But one thing in particular that makes this thing difficult is the fact that we have e being raised to a negative power with a squared term inside of it. Now, if you've taken your Math 113s, your Calc 2s, and stuff like that, you might know this is extremely difficult to integrate. In fact, to find a generic formula is not possible. 
with our current understanding of mathematics, as far as we're aware, right? So instead of actually finding a formula for the CDF of x, what we have to do instead is we have to make a table. Uh, we use computers to find probabilities, okay? Here's this table. This is on the second page of the document that I've given to you, right? This table is going to be super nice, okay? This is the area under the standard normal curve to the left of a z value, of a z score, if you will. So, we'll come back to it in a second. Why would this be useful? Well, let's think for a second. If I had something like a test score that was distributed as a normal random variable with a mean of like 75 and a variance of like 14, something like that, maybe. In fact, let's make it easy with a variance of 9. I could draw that graph. I could draw that graph really easily, right? It's going to look something like that. We're going to be centered at 75. And what if I want to know, OK, like what's the probability that uh, somebody scored less than, I don't know, a 60, right? What's the probability that, you know, the test score is less than 60? Well, all I have to do, if I know that my scores are distributed in this way with this shortcut, all I'd have to do is come onto this graph here, find 60, and then find the area under the curve to the left of 60, right? Because that's where the scores are less than 60. And like, I would know how often they happened, right? The trouble is, I can't do that. Because that means I have to integrate this monstrosity of a formula. You know, look at that. And I literally can't do that. Like, we do not have the math to do that. So, what we do instead is we say, okay, we can't integrate every single possible normal random variable. We can't integrate any of them. We could approximate them with computers, but like, there's an infinite amount of possibilities for what kind of normal variable you have. You can have a normal 12 2000, a normal 12 2000.001, and so on and so forth, and they're gonna be different. They're gonna look different. So what we did is we took these normal random variables and we standardized them down to one single type of normal variable, the standard normal, and we went through and we just got the probabilities under the curve, like the area under the curve to the left of z, as best as we can approximate it for that one kind of normal variable. So we only have to just get, we can get any normal variable of any shape, 12, 2000, 79, 75, 9, whatever we want. If we can just turn it into the Z, we can use this table right here. So the probability that the test is less than 60, for example, might look as follows, right? What if I took test and standardized it? That would be equal to the probability. We're going to take test and turn it into a Z, right? So let's do test minus 75 over not uh, over 3, my bad. That would be the standard deviation because the variance is 9, is less than, and then I have to keep the inequality true, right? So we'll do 60 minus 75 over 3. And that turns into, well, test was a normal variable, and I subtracted the mean and divided by the standard deviation. So that turns into a z, right? Then it's less than. I haven't changed the inequality at all. 60 minus 75 is negative 15. Negative 15 divided by 3 is, uh, is what? Is negative 5. This is a bad example. Give me one second. What if my test is less than 72? <laughs> Just really quick, because you're going to see for a second why negative 5 is going to be obnoxious here. Uh, but I will show you in a second. 72 minus 75 is negative 3. Negative 3 divided by 3 is negative 1. So these equations right here, these probabilities, the probability that a person scored less than 72 on their test, the probability that a person scored, that what a person scored minus 75 over 3 is less than 72 minus 75 over 3, and the probability that a standard normal variable is less than negative 1, those are all the same thing, OK? But how do I know this, right? I can't just integrate the standard normal PDF, right? I can't go in there and say, where are my colors? There are my colors. Here's the standard normal, right? Well, I know I need to be at negative 1 
right? But I can't just integrate that. So what do I do? I'm going to show you what to do. You come to this table. You say, OK, I have a z score or a z value of negative 1. It's what we're going to call a critical value. And we'll get into it later why that's important. But for now, all we're going to do is we're just going to use it to read the chart. And I want to know, what's the probability that a standard normal variable, after I've standardized whatever it is, what's the probability that any standard normal variable has a value less than 1, less than negative 1? Okay? The way that we read this table is as follows, right? Where it has z here and then 0. and then it has um, 0 0.00, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 and then over here it has negative 3.4, negative 3.3, dot 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 dot, and then in the middle we have all our numbers. If I had a z score or the z critical value were negative 3.32, here's how I read the table. I take this number right here, the first two decimal points, 3.3, .3, and I use that row. And then I use the last, the third decimal point, right, the 0.02, and I meet right here at a number, okay? So if it were th negative 3.3, .3, boom, we come over here to this 0.02, and we would see that it's 0.0005, okay? That's not super useful because, of course, this negative 3 is like way out here. Negative 3.32 is like way out there. So it's nothing crazy, right? Well, it's actually super crazy. If you got a Z score like that, it's super crazy, right? That person has a score that's like, I mean, like most people aren't going to score less than like 60 with these stats, as you can tell, because that would need like a Z score of 5, and the distribution is tiny out there, right? But for negative 1, that's definitely a number that seems more reasonable, right? And in fact, if we come to negative 1.00, right? Here's the negative 1. Oh, nope. Here's the negative 1 row. And then up at the top, here's the 0 .00 column. So let's come down to where they intersect. We get a 0.1587. So the probability that any standard normal variable takes on a value of less than negative 1 is equal to 0 0.1587, or about 16%. Does that make sense? Well, I think it might if we draw this correctly, right? Here's 0. Uh, we want to say that negative 1 is out here and like 1 is out here. So the area under this tiny part of the curve to the left of negative 1 is about 16% of the area under the distribution, right? 16% of the test scores are less than 72 in the same way that 60%, 16% of uh, the possible values, like the 16% of the Z values that you would get if you ran a billion randomized things and turned them into Zs would be less than negative one, right? About 16%. In the same way that 16% of test scores you would expect to be smaller than 72, given this data set, okay? That is how you read the table. You can also do this. Uh, we just looked at a one-sided test here, right? Z is less than negative 1. But you could do this for, like, an interval, right? What if I were interested in, like, my S's are kind of reverbing today. But what if I were interested in, you know, the probability that somebody had test scores and in fact, let me write this like this. What if I were interested in the probability that somebody scored between 75, the average, is less than their test score, is less than, I don't know, let's say 80, 87. Why not? Right? What is that probability? Well, again, let me standardize it because I don't know how test is distributed. I mean, I know how test is distributed, but I don't know the, the, the probabilities I don't know how to integrate that. I don't know the areas under that kind of curve. So what I need to do instead is I need to standardize this. So that's going to be the probability that 75 minus 75 over you know, 3 is less than test minus 75 over 3 is less than 87 minus 75 over 3. And that's going to turn into, now that we've standardized it, Right? You can see that this is going to be standardized, minus the mean over the standard deviation. That would be the probability that 0 is less than a z is less than, 
87 minus 75 is 12. 12 divided by 3 is 4. All right, I got to pick different numbers. But basically, how would I do this? Well, I would find, I, I draw my little graph, right? And I recommend drawing these graphs. Like, get used to doing that. It's going to be super helpful, right? I draw this little graph, and over here I put 0, and way out here I'll put 4. And I'll say, what is the probability in this region? How can I find it? Well, one thing I can do, I would need to find the probability of being less than zero, right? And then I could find the probability of being, what, greater than four? And then I can just, you know, add them together, that plus that, and subtract it from one, one minus plus plus plus, right? And you know, like the area under the curve still has to integrate to one. So if I find these pro oh no, if I find this probability and I find that probability, and then I, I can just find what's in the middle of them, right? Or I could do something even easier, right? What if instead, these are all perfectly valid ways to approach the, the question. What if I found the area under four and subtracted the area under zero? or to the left of zero, if you will, right? What if I did, you know, black minus blue? That would also work. And in fact, let's do it, okay? What is the probability that z is less than zero? Well, that's really easy. I'm going to come to my z table. I'm going to go down to the row with 0.0, .0 right? Or negative 0.0, .0. they're the same. And my third digit is zero. So what's the probability? It's exactly 50%, right? So I have 50% um, here is the blue. That should be 0.5, my bad. But what is the black? Well, let's find a z value of 4. Uh-oh, my table isn't big enough. But what do I notice? Well, check this out. Like, the biggest value on the table is... 3.49, okay? That has a probability value of 0.9998. And since it's the closest thing to four on my table, I'll just use that, 0.9998, right? We can be a little bit loosey-goosey here for a reason I'll explain in just a second. But that would give me about point, uh, point what is it, 4998, which is basically 50%. You remember that rule of thumb we learned at the beginning of class that most of your data is going to fall between plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean? Well, the z-score, if you'll notice, is in units of standard deviations, right? You divide by standard deviation in the same way that you divide by hours when you're calculating miles per hour. So the reason that you don't see hardly anything bigger than four on the standard normal table is because to be four standard deviations away from the mean is crazy. It almost never happens. And so like this number here makes sense because you're basically eating up almost all of the distribution. Like the area under the curve to the left of four is so small. It's tiny, but it is there technically. So we kind of account for it like this. That's basically everything you need to know about normal variables at the moment, right? You can subtract things from normal variables. Heck. You can even add normal variables together, right? If I wanted to do like, if I had x distributed as n12, 2000, and z distributed as n01, right? What would be the distribution of x plus z? It'd, be, it'd still be a normal variable. That's a fun fact. <coughs> Pardon, sorry. <clears throat> well, it would be as follows, right? What would be the expected value of this? Well, the first thing to know is that it would still be a normal variable. Okay? You add normal variables together, it's fine. They stay normal. But what are the parameters? Well, like I said before, it's the expected value of the thing and the variance of the thing. So all you'd have to do is take the expected value of x plus z, and then the variance of x plus z, pass the operators through, and you could get those parameters. In this case, it's really nice, uh, because it would turn into 12, and let's see, the variance of x plus z would turn into the variance of x plus the variance of z, that would be a 12, 2001 normal random variable. Fun stuff. That's everything that we have for you on normal variables again. 
Uh, and then just one more time, the link to get to this download for the chart, if you need it, is tmorg.org slash downloads. It'll be the first thing on the list. And for now, the only thing on the list, right? So that is going to cover everything from the normal distribution. Super good stuff. We are getting caught up because I'm actually behind while I'm recording this. I'm s supposed to be recording the next one right now, but it's okay. Uh, time waits for no man, but, you know, it's all right, as long as the test hasn't happened yet. Uh, today, in the mini lecture, we talked about the Bernoulli and uniform distributions. We didn't spend a lot of time on them, and then we spent a long time on the normal distribution. And I hope you can acquaint yourself really well with this normal distribution and how reading this table works, okay? And I'll point out more in the next video about how the table works and how reading this version of the table or, or how reading the normal probabilities table is going to be slightly different from the next probability tables that we're going to read. We'll talk about that all in the next video, but for now, you know how you know what the Bernoulli distribution is, you know what the uniform distribution is, and you know a lot more about the normal distribution than you knew before. You know how to do some fun stuff with it. That's going to be everything for today. Stick around for next time in Lab Hours when we talk about t uh, some more common distributions and something really cool about distributions. We're going to talk about the chi-squared distribution, the t distribution, and the central limit theorem, which is not a distribution, right? So stick around next time for that. As always, thanks for stopping by Lab Hours. If you have any questions, as always, if you're in the class, email tmorg.ta at gmail.com. And if you're not in the class, email labhours at tmorg.org. Or just leave a comment, leave a like, subscribe, Share the video with people who you think are going to take stats or just review it for yourself if you've forgotten the joys of a normal random distribution, a normal random variable. Enjoy. Thanks again for stopping by. And as always, we'll see you around next time. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.